Welcome to the third episode of Demol Belkia, season 10 recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is the Canadian who loves to go around telling locals that their town smell of shit, Logan Saunders. <laughs> Good evening. I said this on the Bothers Bar Discord last night when I was watching the episode, but the Spanish sentences task is a contender for my favourite ever Belgian Mole challenge. <laughs> it's not even the, the whole challenge, that was the fraction of a challenge. It's just utterly ludicrous. I'm surprised how bold they were with some of those Spanish sentences because the the two contestants don't know Spanish very well. They just have to smile politely while they're saying the rudest things possible. <laughs> it's like they rang us up last year and said, if we were to um, to get the, the players to interact with locals, what sort of sentences, jokingly, would you want them to say? And they actually went with our suggestions. It's like they experienced me trying to try and do any random uh, Flemish phrases that they could just supply me with that I would just d- take at face value and not realize I was getting trolled until well after the fact. But even even despite that challenge, I think this is one of the strongest Belgian mold episodes ever. I was thinking back to all of the other reality shows that have had a contestant either quit or get medically evacuated or be in that borderline area. It was very interesting editing wise because at the start of it, when when uh, Nella went for her went for her doctor appointment at the start of it, and, and she showed her leg, how bruised it was. I was thinking, oh, she's she's probably going to get medically evacuated by the end of it, or 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 quit. I thought she's going to quit by the end of the episode, but the way they constructed the whole episode, you don't even realize that she quit or was medically evacuated until after the elimination had occurred. No, it was really suspicious. But you never knew. Yeah, they really held it in suspense there where there was still that element of surprise at the end because after the quiz is over you think, oh, I guess I guess she's still gonna she's still gonna tough it out. Maybe it's next week that she'll get medically evacuated or quit. But then they reveal, oh, actually she got the lowest score on the quiz because she quit and didn't do the quiz. I'm thinking, well I guess that's the best way in terms of production value and trying to stick to the integrity of the game. That's the best way to eliminate someone who who's opted to quit. Yeah. I said this when we did the Georgia episode with uh, Jean-Marc quitting, because that is the most recent example of someone quitting the mole. It's a very rare thing for people to quit on the mole. Well, because I believe, what is the, who's the other? The other Vidim quitter was from... The Japan se- season, right? Yeah, we had Janine who got medevaced in South Africa, and we had God, what was his name in Japan? Manuel. Yeah, that's the guy. Was he? Did he quit or was he medically evacuated? No, he quit. He quit due to a stomach bug. Yeah. So it's sort of that borderline area. It's funny because you don't think of the mole as a show where people could potentially quit or be medically evacuated because it's not like they're the longest they're ever out in the jungle for is for one task, usually at the most in a season. I mean, they're staying in five-star hotels most of the time. Tasks tend to be a lot more mental. They're not as physically active. And yet, here we are, for the first time ever in Belgian Mall, we have somebody quit. Yeah, I think they handled it very respectfully. Not that that's a surprise at all, but I think I think it, it shows with how they treated Naila Quinn, how much they actually care about these people. Yeah, I can't. Of course, we compare it to American reality shows all the time, but the first Survivor quitter, Austin, probes made sure to humiliate him as much as possible to discourage other people from quitting. And then over the years, when when people were quitting more frequently, probes tried to, to add on the humiliation factor again because it was getting out of control a bit. I should also add with Survivor as well that it's made the audience really curse out anybody who quits regardless of how sick they get just anybody who leaves the game voluntarily that draws the criticism of oh you took my spot that should have been my spot on the show how dare you and why why did you even sign up for this you're the worst you gave away the biggest opportunity people dream of this people would give an arm and a leg to go on there and then here we are with our first example of somebody quitting on belgian mole and I think Jill treated it the best way he could to prevent that outcry from the public. He was really nice to 
to Nayla, and I've got a feeling that the Belgian public isn't going to be as hard as, as hard on her as Survivor fans are on contestants in the American or the Australian versions. No, I mean, we are recording this on Tuesday, the day after the latest Australian Survivor finale, where someone literally said on Reddit that they were sick of floaters taking their spot in the game. The argument to that is, you are never going to get cast because you probably don't have the personality for it. Yeah, it was never their spot to begin with. No, but I don't think the Belgian public would ever take the attitude that certain subsets of reality TV fans do when it comes to quitters. But I, I think it did get to the point with Naila where she was actively restricted on what bits of challenges she could do. And the show was still being physical and it got to the point where someone had to sit down and go, it's not going to get any less physical. Are you sure you're able to continue? How do you feel? I was, I was thinking about that too. The whole atmosphere. I was, I think at the very end, what I put in my notes, did she quit because she mentally had enough of the game or did she quit because she physically had enough of the game? I think she definitely physically couldn't go forward. I think it was probably cut from the first challenge that she had to be in the hotel room. She had no choice about that. Oh, yeah, I see. Because the other bits were just too physical for her to do. Scuba diving, yeah, that could be possible. Also, she might need to breathe a bit. But she, if she's in pain, she's going to be taking up more oxygen too, right? We tend to breathe faster when we're in pain as well. Yeah, she definitely couldn't have done the diving, but I'm not sure whether she would have been able to do the walking around the harbour either. Yeah, it could be. That, that's a very good point. Either of the other two tasks, and that it's really a no contest for the challenge. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, even if she didn't fall on the challenge, do you think she would be the type that would say, like, say she gets really winded after each of these physical challenges, do you think she, that even without that fall, do you think she would have continued? Or if she would have maybe lasted maybe one more episode and said, you know what, I'm good with my experience, I'm ready, I'm ready to go home. I don't think she would have quit had she not injured herself, because she seems like very much the sort of person who would push through the pain as much as she can. But I think it probably would have got to the point where she fell into the space where her archetype usually does, which is kind of a a mid-season boot. You usually see people with the same archetype as Nayla falling kind of fourth or fifth episode. Falling. That was a bad pun, Michael. (laughs) Unintentional pun there. Going out sort of fourth or fifth episode. So I think it would have got to the point where she kind of either went home or was the mole. It was approaching a put up or shut up moment in terms of whether they'd cast someone like Naylor as the mole. I was thinking too, because they made her sit out of the space station challenge, but the only physical part really was hopping over that barrier. So I couldn't help but think that that's a, if she can't do that, what can she do physically in the for the rest of the season, right? They were never letting her anywhere near a blindfolded spinning chair challenge after her falling over on the on the lava fields. There was not a chance they would even letting her touch that challenge. Yeah, because that wasn't even... That's not a very physical thing to do. It was just walk a few steps and then you and then you hop once. If, she, if they were afraid that she couldn't do that... It all depends whether you're Sven or Jens. Those two did a lot more than a couple of steps. Yeah. But she wouldn't have. She wouldn't have been using Sven's or Yen's strategy. She would have been smarter about it. <laughs> but I just couldn't help but think, if they, if she was restricted on that, how many more challenges would she have been restricted to do? That's why I was surprised. If she's not able to do that, how is production not removing her from the game? How much, as a producer, can you work around a player? I think it probably did just get to the point where someone sat down and said, are you comfortable to are you comfortable to continue because this is only going to get more physical? Yeah. Or maybe the way, maybe with her, in, it was a muscle tear, right? Yeah. So that, that would take a while to, that would take a lot more medical oversight for it to heal. It's not going to heal anywhere near before the end of the season. No, she said to Jill on the way out, she could in theory continue, but it wasn't going to get any better. It wouldn't have been a fun experience on the show overall to be, She'd be sitting out probably almost every challenge. And then for all the other contestants, they're probably thinking, well, she can't be the mole. If she was the mole, I think they would have just stopped filming right there. 
And that would have been the worst if she was if she was chosen as the mole and she falls in the very first challenge because that's something we discussed with Jill last year is what happens if the mole gets injured? <laughs> Do you remember what his answer was? They would not air it on TV and the whole season would be done. <laughs> the season would be cancelled. Cancelled, yeah. So I was thinking, well, if she fell and she's, she's sitting out of challenges, she cannot be the mole whatsoever because if she was the mole, Jill would have said, cancel this season, we're going to pick a new group. And that leads me to one more question is, with what happened to her, is that going to impact how they cast for future seasons? Are they going to risk casting somebody who's similar, who has similar characteristics to her? I was just about to ask you the same question, whether it will impact future casting, because I think it is more likely to impact future challenges than future casting. I think they wouldn't do a challenge where people have to, for example, sprint on a loose surface anymore. Because that's why she fell. I think it's much more likely to impact that sort of stuff than the actual casting. That's a good point. They could take a closer inspection of, hey, what's the easiest way for somebody to get injured in this challenge? I mean, there are really weird ways to injure yourself. But also with contestants who are on the older side, we've seen it on Survivor and every reality show ever. They are more injury prone. They do get medically evacuated from a season far more than younger contestants do. That's just human biology, unfortunately. (laughs) I don't think it's going to impact them casting older females still. But I mean more in terms of casting older females as the mole. Because then in future, what what happens if next season they they decide, oh, we're going to have the older female contestant to be the mole, and she gets injured in the first or second round of play? Because cancelling a season just sounds... That sounds like the one scenario you want to avoid at all costs. Oh yeah, it's a worst case scenario for them. Yeah, it's like you'd rather pick a somebody who's not going to be your best mole option possible rather than somebody who could be a really good mole but be very injury prone to the point that they're unable to continue, which is which is what happened what happened here. So previously the final ten described their ideal partner before being faced with a huge twist a tied destiny's execution that would send two of them home. A cooking challenge went awry before the group walked the plank to earn no money for a second challenge in a row. When faced with the chance to swap partners or earn money for the pot, the group chose the money, a choice that proved costly for Germany and Tintin, who were the ones sent home. We open with a speech from Soraya, a model for some underwater statues at the age of 11. And the opening quote is from one of our favourites, Marsena, and it's just breathe, don't stress, it'll be okay. And I was thinking about this when I was waiting to see who the opening quote was going to be from. I would have put money on them doing a quote from the diving challenge in South Africa, given it did tie in with this week. Yeah, the one where they had to memorize the flags? Yeah. So which episode was this quote from then with Marzena? Marzena only lasted, what, three episodes, wasn't it? Yeah. Would it have been from the, the glasses twist with Bertrand? I don't know. I can't actually remember where this where this quote comes from, but it can only have been one of the first three. If I had to guess, it probably would have been the challenge on the rooftop. That could have been it too, because she didn't make it far enough. The diving challenge was later on, wasn't it? Yeah, the diving challenge was like final five, final six. Drunk Museum Heist was in her boot episode. Yeah, she went home episode three. Maybe it was from the Drunk Museum heist when she's in the van telling everyone else what to do. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know, but it's from very early in South Africa anyway. Just breathe. Don't stress. It'll be okay. Just steal these priceless African artifacts. If you put a gun to my head and asked me to guess who the the person who gets quoted from South Africa would have been, Marsena probably would not have been high on that list. Speaking of which, I wouldn't have expected Marsena and Issa to be the last two quotes. No. It's very interesting. I mean, we love both of those people, but if you had to name the cast of their respective seasons, you probably wouldn't think of them very quickly. They wouldn't be your first first guess from someone from that season. Which episode number did Isa go home? She was third boot too, wasn't she? Yeah, and then Marzena was third boot, and this was the third episode. Fourth boot she was. Okay. Because it was, it was Ruth, then Mark, then Manuela, and then Isa. Mm-hmm. Manuela. 
<laughs> Talking to the older female going home. Yeah, Ruth and Manuela and, and Gretel and Nayla. Nayla's more of a Manuela than a, uh, a Ruth, I think. We also have Ingrid in the mix there. None of them can make it too far. <laughs> so it's day six in Tabiesco, and everyone wakes up to a lovely breakfast and custom water bottles on the table. Sven said to Tun that if either of them go out, they should look at the moon and know that they were looking at the moon at the same time, <laughs> sharing a moment still. <laughs> and the phone rings and Anka answers with video. Gilles tells them that they have three potential experiences today. He's looking for four adventurous art lovers, two people who want to learn Spanish, and two who will get to chill at a hotel for the day. Naylor volunteers to chill, as does Bert. Sven says beginner Spanish is nothing, but he still doesn't want to try it. Anka volunteers to do Spanish, and Yen suggests Philippe as he speaks French. And I'm assuming that they were told the actual Spanish speakers, Manu, Yens, and Uma, couldn't volunteer for that challenge. I would assume so. That would be the... Otherwise, they're dumb. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they were probably told that they weren't allowed to do that, just because it would have been way less entertaining a challenge for the Spanish language challenge if, you know, people actually knew what they were saying. And it ends up with Sven, Uma, Manu, and Jens as the art lovers. And Jill also tells them that the empty bottles need to be as full of piss as possible by that evening. A sentence that I don't think I ever would have guessed that I was going to have to write. <laughs> it's like one of our hoax sentences. I know we have said it time and time again that Jill de Costa takes the piss. But literally in the episode, Jill does end up taking the piss. <laughs> I was thinking, are they testing for performance-enhancing drugs? Are they finally, finally approved of drug testing in Season 10? It opens so many questions, because obviously they end up tricking them in the, the space challenge with the water with a bit of vinegar in it. But what actually happened to the piss? Who had to dispose of, of the urine? <laughs> yeah, again, a sentence I didn't expect to have to say on the podcast. That's uh, that's one intern job I would regret doing. Exactly. I know that we have said in the past that we would love to work on a season of The Mole. But if the showrunner of the show turned around and said, yeah, you're in charge of urine disposal, I'm not sure I would be as enthusiastic about working on a season of The Mole. Can you imagine if Jill DaCosta hires us and then we're hired to dispose of the urine bottles? Then he can just say, oh, you two want to be a part of this? You're in charge. And I'm thinking, oh... That's not what I was expecting. Bad pun. Bad pun, GDC. Bad pun. And also, you know as well as I do, she will absolutely end up giving those bottles away to them at the reunion. <laughs> if the reunion comes around and he does not hand those bottles out, empty probably and washed, I will be very disappointed at him. Maybe next season, somebody gets brought back and they have to bring the, the urine bottle and there's a there's an exemption hidden inside of it that they didn't know about for the past year, but I guess now that their urine is being tested, I guess uh, uh, Nayla couldn't inject steroids because athletes take steroids to heal from their injuries faster. So that's probably another reason why she's like, "Well, I'm gonna quit now if they're gonna start drug testing." Yeah, good point. So the four art lovers are on their way to Castillo del Aguila, a coastal town. Gilles meets them there and explains that they're going to an atypical museum, an underwater one named the Museo Atlantico. They need to find two statues that are 12 metres deep. They get a crash course in deep sea diving from a lovely man named Jürgen. Bert and Naylor are a few hundred metres away at the Mirador Papagayo, a five-star hotel. They get to chill for the day in the hotel room where they find a note saying to take a long, warm shower. On the wall are two statues in pictorial form, as well as flags, binoculars, mobile phone and some brochures suggesting that all may not be what it seems. They also look around and find a Spanish Bible, eight pairs of shoes, and lots of other random items. And condoms. And condoms, because, you know, you've always got to be safe on the mole. Shield tells us that their role is central, as they can help identify the two statues which are worth 1,500 euros each, and can also help Anker and Philippe with their challenge later on. The divers will go in pairs and try to take a selfie with the right statue. Whilst one team dives, the other one will draw the statue with Naylor and Bert's help. Their time limit is their oxygen tank's length, which can be more than an hour, for an experienced diver. Very interestingly worded, some of that, I have to say. Because one bit of that does come back a little bit later, in that the time limit is the oxygen tank's length, and we specifically find out that, it, that the oxygen tank's length can be more than an hour for an experienced diver. And when Sven and Jens resurface... They say that they were down there for more than an hour. 
But how do they know they were down for more than an hour? I don't know. They discussed it with the girls, by the sound of things. Sven and Yendry surfaced less than a minute before the drawing appeared. They argue on the boat as it can't take an hour to draw the picture, which suggests that someone is an experienced diver. And neither neither one says they were exper- an experienced diver, only Uma, right? Neither one of them says it to us, which only makes me more suspicious of Sven as my number one suspect all season long. <laughs> Sven definitely did a lot of... He did a lot of sabotages this week. If it is Sven, which is my number one suspicion at the moment, spoilers for the end of the episode, if it's Sven, then we will see a scene of him learning to dive, or telling us that he's an experienced diver and he's done it before. Yeah, because both Sven and Manu are both shown panicking, right? Sven didn't. Sven was very calm. Jens had trouble with the pressure, and Uma was very experienced. Sven we didn't really see much of. In the diving bit, yeah, Jens is a bit. Yeah, Sven and Jens were both were both suspicious. It was very interesting, and it set off alarm bells in my head when uh, when they started arguing that it doesn't take an hour to make a photo because you know we've already been told that experienced divers, the tanks can last an hour for. Uma and Manu contact Naylor and Bert, but they think that they will reveal a message by turning the shower on. The boat teams must play guess who with Naylor and Bert asking specific questions for a yes or no answer to eliminate statues. They must then draw the statue for the divers and put it down into the ocean. Naylor and Burke can't speak back. They can only wave the red or green flags. It's like Shy Guy says from Mario Party. Each question asked costs the group 100 euros from the potential 1500 for each statue. Manu asks about gender and they find out they're looking for a female statue. Then we go to my favourite bit of this challenge, which is Anchor and Philippe. You get a tablet with lots of Spanish phrases on it, some useful, some not so much. The translation of each of the sentences costs them 250 euros. Anka gets a small speaker hidden under her scarf and gets duct tape over her mouth, which is kind of unnecessary, and a face mask. And Philippe gets control of the tablet to control what she says. They have one hour to find the two models hiding around the harbour. Naylor and Bertha are allowed to send two texts during the hour, containing only numbers, and one for each person that Anka and Philippe are looking for. Now, as we said earlier, some of these sentences are very useful. Some of them are the sort of things that we would write if we were doing a parody of this episode. Particular highlights include telling someone that their town smells of shit. Excuse me, I find myself very attractive. Do you want to go on an adventure with me? And the perennial favourite, pull my finger. And I think there was a, can you lick your elbow? There was indeed a long discussion on whether someone can lick an elbow. Can you lick somebody else's elbow for me? How much fun would they have had in the production office just coming up with stupid sentences here? Did they bring in a team of comedy writers and just they figured out who had the funniest bits to throw in? What was the line that they reached? What was the most offensive thing that they were allowed to actually say to someone? That's what I want to know. (laughs) Just fuck you. Just fuck you is written in there. (laughs) What got rejected? Yeah. Was there a sentence that when they pressed the button, it just said Chupamela? which is the one Spanish insult I know, thanks to a Spaniard I used to work with. It's a general catch-all, fuck-off insult. Chupamela. Maybe there was like, oh, you, you probably like personal insults about the person's physical appearance or something? Yeah, I, I just, I wonder what got rejected on this challenge. There had to have been some rejected ones. Like your for your forehead looks like the moon or something like that? Yeah, because the other element of this, and someone pointed this out on the Discord, is that because of the whole being able to translate the sentences to 250 euros of the potential money bit, Jill had to record him saying all of these sentences. Jill had to record himself saying the translation of, this town smells like shit. He had to record himself saying, I find myself very attractive, do you want to go on an adventure with me? Release those tapes. I want that soundboard. (laughs) I wish they would have like they would have copied some of the insults from Seinfeld, such as the well the jerk store called and they're running out of you, or well I had sex with your wife. So Bert and Naylor's <laughs> instincts that the mirror had a message on it was correct. For each model, they get three questions that are written on the mirror. The numbers for those answers give them the correct numbers to text to Anka and Philippe. The first two questions are how many glasses there are in a bottle of wine and how many red M and M's there are in the bowl. Uma asks whether the woman is wearing a dress, and she is told yes. 
and Bert doesn't trust Naylor to go on the balcony alone. There is no bottle opener, so they have to use their makeshift method. Thanks to a tablet, they find out that there is a YouTube video playing, teaching them how to open a bottle of wine using a wall and a shoe. You know what would have been great? Is if Nayla is banging the bottle of wine inside the shoe against the wall, and somehow she falls down again. What would have been great is if she was banging it that hard that the bottle broke. Yeah, and there's just shards of glass all cut up in her finger. She's like, oh, I gotta go see the doctor again. I like how Bert comes over and he opens the bottle of wine within about 0.2 seconds after Nayla was smashing it against the against the hotel wall for about, about half an hour, it seemed like. Oh yeah, as we discussed last week, Bert used to live in the woods. Bert absolutely knows makeshift methods to open a bottle of wine. He does not need a bottle opener in his eco-capsule. No, he could have just used his teeth, probably. (laughs) The fourth question asks whether the woman's dress is above her knees, and they say yes. They then follow it up with whether she's holding something in her hand, which Naylor says no to, which gives them the correct statue. Bert decides that 20 glasses are in a bottle of wine. The third question for Model 1 is what the total of the alcohol percentages in the cocktail is, and Bert tastes it and says it contains triple second tequila, and is 62% as a result. I am very impressed that he was able to figure that out. Was it a margarita? Would a margarita be the same percentage? Well, a margarita is is triple second tequila, is the alcohol, I think. So if he knows it's a margarita, unless they're tricking him, then it's it's less of a question of identify the alcohol, and more of a question of, do you know what alcohol is in a margarita? Yeah, so then he would just have to know he had ingredients. Yeah. I think, and I'm speaking purely as someone who does not drink here, I think it is triple sec tequila and lime juice normally. Yeah, yeah, the lime, yeah, the lime, the, lime, the salty lime rim. So Uma delivers her drawing finally, after putting a lot of detail into it. The third question of model number two is the number of the Chinese characters written on the mirror. Bert starts on this, but then realises he hasn't heard from Naylor in a while, and finds her on the balcony holding the flag, as the girls <laughs> haven't told her to put it down yet. They should have done a, a montage of like the the sun going down and the moon coming up and the moon coming down and the sun going up and then showing the showing it go from summer weather to the leaves turning orange and then snow coming down and Nayla just withering away on the balcony very slowly. <laughs> I find it hilarious that they deliberately kept Nayla away from the strenuous activities here and then put her into something that arguably could pass as a final immunity challenge on Survivor. (laughs) And something that has genuinely been used to torture prisoners of war before. I'm holding this red flag. They didn't tell me no yet. I I, I think you can put it down. Nope. They didn't give the signal. We have to stick to the rules, Bert. (laughs) I need to keep my arms above my shoulders at all times. She does eventually put the red flag down and they settle on 61 as the number of the Chinese characters. As I said, Sven and Jens resurface. Less than a minute before the drawing appeared, Sven went into the red zone, and they had to come back. They argue on the boat that it can't take an hour to draw the picture, which suggests someone's an experienced diver. The final question that they need for model number one is red animal plus white goddess. They turn the room upside down until they realise that it's talking about trainers, because Bert spots the red Reeboks and the white Nikes, both of which have numbers written on the soles, and they total 87. And the text is sent after 32 minutes of Anchor and Philippe's challenge, just as Anchor and Philippe are asking a woman to pull Anchor's finger. Gotta love the maturity of the production crew. The thing is, if you have a basic knowledge of Spanish and you know what those phrases are saying and you're in charge of that tablet, you cannot tell me that you wouldn't repeatedly make her say, pull my finger to people. Because I would, and I'm a child but it's very funny. (laughs) The phrases tell them that she teaches yoga and what street she's on, which is Amanita Maritima. They take a selfie with her, and if she's the right yogi, they will earn a thousand euros. Hey, boo-boo. Uma and Manu then prepare to dive. Manu, as she said in the pool when she was training, is not entirely comfortable with it. Uma's dived before, but she has to wait a little bit longer for Jürgen and Manu to join her. Manu goes down a bit but then resurfaces as she's struggling to stay calm. I think Manu is is, uh, breaking uh, Jill Van Bull's record of most F-bombs dropped in one episode of of The Mole. I was having this conversation last night, 
about Manu because apparently a lot of the Belgian public didn't like that she was wasting Uma's time here. And what I'm going to say on that subject is I like Manu anyway. I like pretty much everyone who's ever been cast on Belgian Mole. I don't actually think I've bitched about people that much when it comes to Belgian Mole casting. And I'm sure you, you'll be mentally correcting me as I'm going to say the next phrases. But Manu is really interesting as a character because she doesn't she doesn't take any shit from anyone on these on any of these challenges. And she had genuine fear about doing this. But I think it's very inspirational that she kept trying. It doesn't matter that she was wasting Uma's time, because in the end, you know, spoilers, they do end up getting the money from that statue. But I think it's very, very interesting watching her try and overcome her her own fears to do something that she really wanted to do. Because she came into this show with the attitude of, I'm going to try anything that I can because it's a once in a lifetime opportunity and I do not begrudge her for constantly trying and maybe trying five or six times as we see her do and then eventually giving up I mean just one task later she was willing to drink someone's urine yeah she absolutely gave it a red hot crack as they say in Australia and I don't think you can begrudge her for doing that that's just my attitude on it I don't at all have a problem with her quote unquote wasting Uma's time because she didn't. She was overcoming herself. There was also the extra pressure of, it's not just learning how to dive. It's diving with cameras on you, with money up for grabs. And you also have to focus on a drawing and pick out a statue. Yeah. And she was doing this for the first time, having had a morning of lessons. That's it. She had maybe one or two hours of training and then was told, right, you're going to have to dive 12 metres now. That's pretty terrifying. Yeah, because what's the most that anybody usually dives if they go to the beach or they're in a swimming pool? People don't usually dive more than uh, three or four metres, typically. And she ended up getting to like five or six in the end, I think. Yeah, that's pretty far down for a lot more people than you think. So in summary, don't slide into our DMs complaining about Manu because... She tried to overcome her fears this time, and I am not at all going to suffer any fools on this. It was an inspirational moment, and not her wasting Uma's time. Sven and Jens ask if the statue is of a man. No. And if she has a big belly, yes. And that narrows it down to five from the 24 already. They ask if she's wearing a bikini. Yes. Which narrows it down to two. Bert says that he wants to solely do the flags now, rather than trusting Nailis to do it. And in return, she counts the M&Ms again just in case he was sabotaging and spots that he counted the M&Ms wrong. (laughs) The final question for model number two, which we don't actually see them complete, is they need to find the Bible verse in the Gospel of St. Matthew, which Uma wouldn't know about despite being a uh, religion teacher, and where the plot to arrest Jesus is found. Isn't that just Bert? Bert looks like Jesus. He does. Maybe not after next week, though. (laughs) Philippe and Anka find out that the woman that they're looking for is wearing a blue polo shirt, is 17, works as a waitress, and has dark hair. They get no location because they didn't get the Bible verse. They only know waitress, so buy the translation for 250 euros. Sven and Jens ask if the woman has a hand on her side and are told no, which identifies the girl they're looking for. And after 15 minutes, they've already drawn their picture. Manny tries one last time after numerous attempts where she hasn't got further than 2 metres. She approaches 5 metres, but then surfaces again. And Philippe and Anka find a waitress to take a picture with, which will be worth 750 euros if they're correct. Manu decides to just let Uma go alone and returns to the boat. However, Uma has been underwater all the time and her tank is less than half full as a result, and she needs to stay icy cool to not waste any more oxygen. She finds the picture and identifies what she thinks is the statue for 1100 euros, and when everyone resurfaces, Philippe and Anka identified the correct yoga teacher, Uma identified the correct waitress, as did Philippe and Anka, giving them a total of 28.50 of 5,000 euros for the pot. Everyone celebrates doing something as a group, as well as finding out what Anchor's phrases actually said. Which amuses them very, very greatly. <laughs> so we get the usual post-challenge suspicions. Anchor says that Sven's always in the right place, sitting there in the background. Uma says that Sven's drawing looked like an adult, but she'd seen the photos, so she knew it was a girl. And I also saw a theory about the briefing of the mole last week, that the background was identical to Uma's confessionals. However, in this episode, we also see that Bert and Naylor use the exact same place for their confessionals, so that is not a clue. Mm. 
try again, clue hunters. Gilles reminds them at dinner that he did ask for their piss in the morning, and he's going to keep them safe, and takes the piss. He's the milkman. <laughs> Day seven begins with them doing quote-unquote filates. Yen seems to be dressed in a banana-themed romper suit, showing us some of his other tattoos that aren't angel and vagina-themed. Nayla's leg still looks rough, so she goes to the doctor, and she has a muscle tear and has to sit out the challenge. And I think when they're all doing when they're all doing the Pilates, Ian says, "Oh, your guys' poses, your this looks ridiculous." And then Uma just looks back at him in his ridiculous shirt and says, "Well, well, look at your clothing. You're saying we look ridiculous." It's not even his ridiculous shirt. It's the fact that he has a ridiculous shirt on, and is wearing the matching shorts. You know that I love a disgustingly patterned shirt, but even I probably wouldn't touch that shirt. Yeah, he's, he's dishing it out, but he can't take it. You definitely wouldn't miss him in a lineup. Gilles meets him at the Parque Nacional de Timanfaya, the lunar landscape of Lanzarote. It's where the Americans came to simulate moon landings before faking them in Nevada. <laughs> yeah, and Roswell. <laughs> and it is the ideal location for some astronaut training today. Their mission is to launch a rocket within an hour. They have to revise 20 sets of information as a group on their way to the rocket. At the launch pad, they will get five questions and three correct answers gives them 4,000 euros. However, along the way, there are also three physical tests that they must pass individually to make it to the launch pad. The Canary Islands has such cool landscapes. It really does. And I mean, we're finally moving islands next week to what is allegedly Grand Canaria. But I, I think if they're doing a cycling challenge, it's more likely to be on Tenerife, given that Mount Tidy there. Tenerife, especially out of the Canary Islands, is an absolute cycling mecca. There are so many cycling tours that go to Tenerife so that people can ride at Mount Tidy. Mm, that makes sense. So, yeah, if it is Gran Canaria, then they've kind of sort of half asked it slightly because it probably should be uh, Tenerife if they do a cycling challenge. They probably do say Gran Canaria for the finale, you would think. The most elaborate challenges would be there. The only reason that I've heard it's Gran Canaria is because someone on the Vidim forums for Belgia has done a a location map, and they've put a pin for next week in Gran Canaria. Obviously, I don't know the background of it, but if I had to guess which Canary on they'd use a cycling challenge on, it probably would be Tenerife. So they will head there in moon buggies, but the paths are narrow so they cannot overtake each other. Sven volunteers to go alone, and then Jens and Uma, Anker and Bert, and Manu and Philippe pair up. They decide to divide the four buggies over the first four boards and then move up four spaces at a time. Are there any of these boards that you would have wanted to revise? Um, definitely wouldn't have to do the the order of the planets since I teach that to my Eng- There's a a unit in my uh, in one of the units I teach for English where it's about the planets. So I think I've gone through the order of the planets with about ten different students over the past year. <laughs> So I'm thinking, well, I definitely don't have to do that. And then with Buzz Aldrin, Armstrong, and Michael Collins, that's not information I would have to review. The record covers I might be spending the most time on, I think. (laughs) I don't think we've ever discussed this, but I'm a bit of a space nerd. You went to space camp, right? I pretty much did go to space camp um, right before the Greece season. Uh, My brother and I went to Texas for a week. And we did go to the Houston Space Center. And most times when I've been to Florida, we also got a Gandhi Space Center. Didn't this time, because uh, obviously I would have had to drive myself and that would have been a bit dicey. But I love going to like, space museums and stuff. So stuff like the Apollo 11 stuff, I probably would have known inside out. Wouldn't necessarily have known the story of NASA intern Thad Roberts, who stole moon rocks to literally have sex on the moon. <laughs> 7.5 kilometers of moonstone for sex, I believe was the quote in the episode. Yeah, I don't know whether that's entirely accurate because I can't find an article that actually says it was 7.5 kilometers because that is a big aspect of moon rock. Yeah, that's almost like the entire length of Luxembourg. But yeah, I don't think I knew about the uh, the story of Thad Roberts, however hilarious it was when I was Googling it uh, yesterday. Stuff like the planets, I definitely would have known, which makes it a lot more suspicious that Sven didn't. Yeah, the Manu was reviewing it constantly, and I'm thinking, I thought it was just the order of the planets, it's just something that everyone just 
knew off the top of their head. I was trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, but I was thinking, I knew the Order of the Planets even before it came, it came up in the English units over and over again. So that really, really surprised me. Especially when she shut Philippe down for trying to teach her an easy way to do it, which presumably would have been the uh, age-old, my very easy method just speeds up naming planets, which gives you the initials of the uh, of the planets, including Pluto, which isn't one anymore, but yeah, we're in that age group that was initially taught that Pluto was the planet, but it's not anymore. It's just uh, Disney. Disney took it over and just made it into uh, Mickey Mouse's dog, I guess. It did. But um, yeah, my very easy method just speeds up naming planets. That's that's how you remember the honor of the planets. You'd obviously have to think twice if you were doing it in a different language. But in English, it's, it's my very easy method just speeds up naming planets. Yeah, it's just, yeah, I'm very... Very surprised how much people were struggling with it, so much to the point I'm thinking, that nah, seems like a mole action. So I was very much zeroed in on Manu and Sven this week, especially with Manu saying, no, don't teach me how to make this easier for me. <laughs> so Anchor and Bert discover the first challenge, which is drinking an entire glass of filtered piss. Just to make it even more fun, fate decides whose piss they drink. Another sentence that I never thought I would have to write down for this podcast. This challenge, obviously, if you don't know that it's it's water with a bit of vinegar in it, this is the most disgusting thing in theory that they've ever made them do. But it's a hilarious prank. Where's Joe Rogan? Or Bear, or Bear Grylls? For some reason, Bear Grylls in his adventure shows. He loves drinking his own piss. Yeah. The Bear Grylls Memorial Challenge, as I've already dubbed it. I have never even seen an episode of his TV show, but that's just the one thing that my sister always tells me about him. Oh, yeah, Barrett Grylls, that's the guy. That's the guy who drinks his own urine. Or Leo, Leo de Machida, he's a UFC fighter. Apparently he would drink a bit of it to boost his strength to do better in UFC fights. Is that right? Yes. The dragon. So Bert gets Anker, and Anker gets Philippe, apparently. The only good bit about the even idea of them having to drink each other's piss is the whole Jens issue. How everyone knows that Jens's piss is disgusting and that nobody wants to have to drink his piss. Yeah, it has all sorts of different types of liquor in it. It has marijuana, cocaine, and oh my god, it has urine in it too. Lots and lots of urine. (laughs) In another potential mole tactic, everyone talks lots on the walkie-talkie, which distracts Sven. Everyone was so pissed off. <laughs> if Sven is not the mole, Sven's reactions are making this season now. Because he was so annoyed at everyone. Philippe, I think Philippe was just as annoyed as he was. Because Philippe was in the car with Manu. And Philippe kept telling Manu, like, yeah, why are you? You're just being a bit too much for me right now. And then he also went on the walkie-talkie to yell at Ank and Bert saying, now chill out, I'm trying to study. Stop talking. <laughs> yes, this is, there is no interdiscipline. No, they just need Ellie Lust there glaring at them until she teaches them some interdiscipline. And Jens has a tattoo of Buzz Lightyear? Yeah, apparently so. And we don't even see any of the stuff that he has to revise about Buzz Lightyear, but he, he says that he doesn't need to revise it anyway. I have a tattoo of Buzz Lightyear. I know everything about him. <laughs> yeah, all I'll say on that point is, Jens, call me when you max out the score on Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin as I did when I was in Florida a couple of weeks ago. Got a screenshot of it and everything. That'd be funny if the question came up. Who did the who did the voice of Buzz Lightyear? Tom Hanks. Well, they're rebooting it now. Lightyear comes out in a few weeks, I think. I think it's Chris Evans now. Reboot, but they it's still in the number four just came out like two years ago. It's an origin story, I think. What? Toy Story needs an origin story? It's just called Lightyear. It comes out on sponsored by our friends over at the new film, Lightyear. It comes out on the seventeenth of June. And he is indeed voiced by Chris Evans off of Captain America. So I think the obvious question is well, how was Tim Allen busy with anything? I don't know. Lightyear revolves around the origin story of the original Buzz Lightyear, the character who inspired the action figure in the Toy Story films. In this film, Buzz does his first test flight in order to experience new galaxies of Star Command to come in peace. 
However, when the evil Emperor Zerg threatens the universe's safety, Buzz may be its only hope to save it. I am very puzzled as to why they just didn't get Tim Allen to do it. Was he asking for too much money? What else is that guy going to do? He's not doing anything else, is he? Because what he had that that stupid sitcom Last Man Standing for uh, like three or four years. I'm looking this up right now. It's also the first Pixar film to actually be released uh, exclusively in cinemas for three years. Oh, so this is the first thing on Google that pops up. The director explained that his casting choice for Roy's voicing Buzz in Lightyear was based on if he believed the actor could actually portray him in a live-action movie and felt Chris Evans has the star power and expertise to bring Buzz to life at either setting. Well, that's dumb. Tim Allen can pull it off. It's Tim Allen. Ar, 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 ar. He can do anything. Yeah. So Anchor over-explains who has done what sign and communication breaks down and it causes a bit of a logjam. Despite Sven repeatedly telling them, Philip and Manny revised some of the album covers that Bert was so excited to actually look at. Anchor and Bert arrive at a balance test and they must sit on a chair as it spins and then walk a short distance and jump a hurdle while blindfolded. Anchor falls immediately and Bert clears it in one, and with Bert's advice, she passes straight after with 20 minutes to spare. Unlike everyone else, because spoilers, our banner this week is one of the many, many fails from Jens. <laughs> I believe one, he went into the reverse direction. Jens walks like a baby giraffe, and Sven just cannot do it. Jens reverses as hard on his feet as Uma reverses in a dune buggy. Sven suggests that Uma leaves Jens behind for him to pick up and moves on. Uma, however, struggles to drive and crashes into Sven's buggy. And then Philippe clears on his first attempt and he joins Uma. Sven, Jens and Manu are all left behind. Sven goes in a circle and Jens and Manu both clear almost simultaneously. Sven fails and he's the only one who has seen a lot of these signs. Poor Manu's attempt when she jumps, skips and then falls on the ground. They couldn't have made Nayla do this. Seriously. And then Manu ends up with a muscle tear, and she also has to quit by the end of this episode. And then Bert and Anchor reach the final challenge, which is throwing a basketball into a hoop while wearing glasses that reverse your vision. With Bert's help, Anchor nails it on her first try. Sven tries a different tactic and clears the hurdle, running through the buggy. Bert also clears the basketball challenger can head to the launch pad with the seven minutes left. They have only seen three signs between them, and as soon as someone goes to the computer, they have to answer a question. The team then change tactics and try and get Sven and Jens, the two with the most knowledge, to the launch pad. Sven scores, but Jens struggles. Philip scores and they debate who to send. Sven stops almost all signs, so he is the first person sent. He chooses animals in space as the first topic, and is asked the name of the cat who was sent to space in 1963, and is correct. He next chooses space tourism, and is asked Jeff Bezos' space company name, and he's correct again. He's then asked what the order of the planets is. And in a classic move, he mixes up Uranus and Neptune and is wrong. He's not confident on the other two topics, which are Moon Landing and Big Bang. Jens then passes a basketball hoop and is sent to the launch pad. Sven gambles and goes for the question on the Big Bang Theory, which is which Luvenar created the Big Bang Theory and he's wrong. And he then bails as Uma and Jens appear with a minute to spare and as the one team who studied the final topic, the Moon Landing. Jens is then asked what the name of the third astronaut on Apollo 11 was. If he's correct, they win 4,000 euros. If not, they earn nothing. The rocket fires, and they do earn 4,000 euros for the challenge, 6,850 of 9,000 for the episode, and 12,850 of 35,600 for the season so far. Where would you put yourself as a mole in this challenge? Pretty much the position that Sven did. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, because even though I'm obviously very much in a tunnel on Sven, and have been for three weeks now. He definitely played this challenge like a mole would play it. You want to be on your own. You want to be at the back where no one else can keep an eye on you. You want to be left at that spinning chair challenge, probably just chatting shit to the cameraman and going, oh yeah, they think that I'm stumbling here. Oopsies, I can actually do it blindfolded. All that sort of stuff. That's the sort of thing that they will put in an end of season montage going, oh, this is the stuff you should have seen. You knew that he was actually chatting shit behind your back. And it's that sort of stuff. But he made sure to show up to the to do the quiz. And if you're the mole, you're thinking, okay, if I get two out of four right, the pressure is all on that next person to do that fifth question, where they have to get it right or else we lose the money. 
without making it too obvious that it's his fault. I've said in previous weeks that as a mole, you don't necessarily want to eliminate all money from the pot, you want to minimize money from the pot. But as a mole, you also don't want to be put in a hero position. Sven was one of the only people this week who did not take any sort of hero position roles and earn any money as a result. He made Jens do it in the end on that quiz by getting two right straight away, getting the easiest question on the board wrong, getting a very hard question wrong so he could go, oh yeah, this all merged together, and then leaving the final board to be an all or nothing question on the topic that was asked very first. It was the very first thing in the entire row that he deliberately left to last because it's the hardest thing to remember because it's so long ago. It's practically an hour ago at this point. So he set up for someone else to take the fall on that and that is really suspicious. Yeah, I just have a tough time with somebody who knows all this information and they mix up Uranus and Neptune, which seems like a really bad pun for the Uran cups in this episode. You know how they like to do the um, the playlist of the mole and stuff? I dread to think what song they would have um, they would have chosen to represent the piss challenge. I, I don't know. I don't listen to songs about urine too often. Could it have been something like "Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head"? <laughs> Umbrella. I, I, that would be the. I think that would be the R. Kelly song. Anything by Wet Wet Wet. And they say that suspicious things happen this challenge, but they learn that if they play as a group. They can sideline the mole. We get a mid-episode briefing of the mole. The producer asks them if they found it difficult, to which the mole says it's different than they expected. They feel like they can't play the game that they prepared for because the group is different than what they sensed in the first two or three days. Everything for the group and every one against the mole. I would love it if there is a season where the mole is just slightly breaking down out of frustration in the briefings, (laughs) but they still use the distorted voice where the the moles in the briefing say, no, fuck, I feel worthless. I'm a worthless human being. And just, you hear like books, books falling off of bookshelves or plates being thrown to the floor. And the producer's saying, no, no, you're, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. You just hear them punching themselves. And then next thing you see Sven with a black eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a, a broken off tooth or something that's bleeding. Like, oh, hey guys. Oh, how are you feeling, Sven? Are you okay? Oh yeah, I'm awesome. Yeah, I fell down on a lava field. I was with Mailer at the time. <laughs> yeah. I got into a bar fight. You should see the other guy. I told I told somebody that their town smelled like shit. It did not go over well. So in the evening, Jill treats him to a night out at the cinema in Arecife for an exclusive movie premiere. What they don't know is that the movie isn't going to be Spider-Man No Way Home, which actually dates this film because that came out right before Christmas. It's a special film just for them, called The Search for the Mole. Just like every year, there were hidden tests in the lead-up to filming the show. This season, that included an improvisation session with actor Frank Fockertain, who is also a drama teacher. Scenes from that are shown as part of the film. None of them expected that everyone would get to see their hidden test, or that their acting would be shown to the group. Jill then comes on the screen and says that they'll be watching the sessions as well as Frank's thoughts on who could and couldn't be the mole. However, as soon as the film starts, so does their time on the test, and they can choose how long they stay for. As a result, it is now time for the test. 20 questions on the identity and actions of the mole. Whoever knows least goes home, except for the mole, who can never go home. I think it's the closest I've ever seen uh, somebody have the last name to Fokker, like from Meet the Fockers. I mean, it's F-O-C-K-E-T-Y-N. That would have been a tough time in school. I thought it was very interesting, the setup for this. Because going into this sort of a... It's not a twist execution, but... Going into this sort of a twist on the test, I think everyone would have thought, well, you stick around to see if there's a post credit scene, surely. And I thought it was very interesting that Gilles specifically talked about, oh, they're not going to see an exclusive premiere of Spider-Man, which is, of course, a Marvel film. Marvel films very well known for their post credit scenes. I think there was a post credit scene, and I think it was probably about half an hour after it finished. And I think that we are going to end up seeing that as part of the reveal. I was thinking that too, because uh, Nayla didn't uh, get up to walk out of the theater right away. And the only thing, the only justification I could think for that is she was waiting to see if it was like a Marvel film and that there was going to be a post credit scene. She gave up about five or six minutes in. I think if she'd have stayed for 
25, 30 minutes, she probably would have seen an extra session with whoever the mole actually was. It's me, Manu. Because I'm putting it out there now. I don't think the mole session was filmed at the same time as everyone else's. I think the mole was already picked before they did this test. And I don't think you can trust Frank's opinions for one second. It's funny because the people that Frank thinks could be the mole are my top three suspects. Because <laughs> he picked Manu. Uh, oh no, he didn't pick Sven. Never mind. He picked, he said Bert, who is high up on my list. Manu, who's very high on my list. Oh, he said Nayla could be the mole. She was at the very bottom of my list going into the execution. Anything like this, I think the mole gets a tip off and has to decide how to play it. Because there's no way they would jeopardise the mole's position in, in the third episode and make it super obvious unless someone wastes 25 to 30 minutes of their test time on it. That's my suspicion. So Gilles tells us that time can be essential in the early parts of the game as people frequently go home based on time when they don't know who the mole is. Frank says, based on improv, that Sven cannot be the mole, and neither can Uma, and Anka leaves at this point only eight seconds into the film. <laughs> she wants a refund on her ticket. She really wanted to watch Spider-Man. <laughs> and she says that Frank had the complete opposite opinions as she did. Frank says that Jens cannot be the mole, but Bert might be. Sven, Uma, and Manu all leave after two and a half minutes. Sven says that he thought Uma did well, but Frank says that she's not the mole, and she's a natural actress. Uma thinks that Manu can lie, based on the film, so she's on her list. Manu says that Anka's acting is very exaggerated and obvious. Frank says she's not the mole, but Manu could be. Philippe leaves then after four minutes. He says that Jens can easily switch between different vibes, which is a useful trait as a mole. Frank says that Nayla could be the mole, but Philippe couldn't. That ends the film, and Jens and Bert leave. Bert says that he's scared of a few people. Philippe, who may have fooled Frank, is one of them. Jens is shocked that Bert came across very sincere on the video. He seems like someone who won't betray you. And Nayla finally leaves when she realises that the film isn't going back on, and we don't even see her do her test. Or she could have said, is this a double feature? Do we get to watch Spider-Man now? I was kind of promised a bit of Tom Holland here. <laughs> is there any chance... Or at least, I don't know, maybe the, the Sam Raimi version with Tobey Maguire? You know, something? Sam Raimi's doing another um, another Marvel film, by the way. What? He's doing the, uh, the Doctor Strange sequel. What about Doctor Strangelove? Not a sequel to Doctor Strangelove. Oh, I wish. That would have been, that would have been very interesting to do that. I, I don't know if Stanley Kubrick would be too happy with it, though. That's the porn parody. The execution takes place in the cinema, with their screens on the projector. And Jill tells them that they are changing islands tomorrow, but someone won't be coming with them. Naylor is the first name to be typed in, and gets an instant red screen. She didn't even do the test, she decided to leave due to ill health and the need to rest from her doctor. And she says that she thinks some people suspected her for not taking the not an exemption card. Sven says it's hard to lose someone, especially when they're your perfect partner. Anka jokes that she hadn't forgiven her for taking the card, and she leaves with her head held high. I also think it's very interesting that Sven is always the first person to comment on the person going home, or the people going home. Because he cried when Gretel went home. I think he was the first person to talk about Tun and, and Germany Jens, and now he's the first person to talk about Naila here. That might be a bit of a stretch. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just something I've thought of then. Oh, I assume... For season 11, they're going to try and redo a twist like this again and say they really didn't get to do the twist this episode. The player quit. Yeah. It all depends on whether there was actually a hidden clue half an hour into the film or whatever. Yeah, I guess if they, they could just keep it hush-hush and not reveal that at the end of the season, right? Because they want to... They didn't get to really use the twist to its full effect this time because it was... Because I think Jill said that. She announced she was quitting even before they stepped into the movie theatre, right? Half an hour before the execution, she decided. Oh, okay. Half an hour before the execution, so... Yeah. Probably, I would assume it would be during the quiz then, right? That she'd be saying, I'm not going to do this? Yeah, she probably stepped out of the cinema and then said to a producer, yeah, I don't think I can continue. Well, there was that slope, that uphill slope out of from the seats to the to the exit, so maybe she had a tough time getting up that slope, and she's like, 
If I can't even get out of the movie theater, if I can't exit the cinema, how the hell am I going to hang in for another six episodes? It does beg the question as to whether they filmed one of these improv sessions with uh, with Germany Jens. Because presumably they filmed one with Gretel, Tun, and Germany Jens as well. But how did they convince him again? Is he the most gullible man in Belgium? That's what I need to know now. He's like the person in high school where if somebody brings a knife to school, they say, well, I don't want it in my locker. I, w- I want Germany Jens to hang on to, to my knives for me or, or to my drugs. He's the one that the principal opens up his locker and says, are these knives and drugs yours? You're suspended, mister. And he's like, what? I didn't know that. They just told me they were micro-machine toys. They were hot wheels. De Slim's Demence is the smartest person in the world. I think it's getting to the point where Germany Jens might be the most gullible man in the world. It wouldn't be, it would be De Slim's the Jens. Oh god, that's your episode title. I don't know how I didn't get that pun straight away. Um, <laughs> Skirting around it. <laughs> like a shark. Da-na, 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 na-na, na-na. Yeah, because apparently they got him to do the dating coach thing by claiming that they were using him as a tester for a potential dating format that they were going to do this year. So I would love them to just have increasingly elaborate lies to tell Germany ends. They really like using me as a tester. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm just getting all the luck this year. <laughs> yeah, I think they feel really bad that I got executed so quickly and are just being kind to me. <laughs> Thanks, Beer. <laughs> so, next time, Gilles closes the laptop, the group head out on a nice bike ride, Sven learns to slut drop, Philip looks out from a ferry, and there is a big transformation for some of the men. So with Naila going home, my team is now Sven, Bert, and Jens, and Logan's is still Anka, Philippe, Manu, and Uma. Sven is still most suspected, followed by Bert, Uma, Anka, and Philippe Tide, Emanuela, and Jens. Imre and Emanuela are the only people less suspected by the two of us in the group as a whole. Two people, Brandon and Alan, had Naila as number one, and two people, Tim and Jack, had her at number ten. Seven people, now including you, have lost their bottom three people for a minimum score of 28. Who do you suspect? So, number one is Manu, number two is Sven, number three is Bert, number four is Anka, then I had a, then I have a massive gap, number five is Philippe, number six is Uma, number seven is Jens, and then number eight was, was uh, Nela, and then she quit. So, for the however many weeks in a row this is, my bottom suspect keeps going home, so the season is proving to be quite frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> well, my top three, unsurprisingly, given what I've said in this episode, are Sven, and then Bert, because Bert was in some very integral places where he could have potentially sabotaged. Miscounted an M&M. Yeah, he, he miscounted the M&Ms. The control role is always an interesting one for them all to be in any way. I don't know, he, he's just always been a little bit suspicious. And then, I mean, by quite a long way, my third is Anchor at the moment. Just because, maybe not this week, but in previous weeks, she's definitely placed herself in the potential sabotage positions. With Bert, I was thinking too that, because I'm reading quite a bit into the whole mold briefing thing, where Bert put himself in that hotel room, and then he miscounted the M&Ms, but he was caught miscounting the M&Ms, and he tried to really control the task. And... I mean, you saw you saw Nayla holding up the red flag for all eternity. So she was really sticking to the system they had. And then in the dune buggies, uh, Bert was he was in the first car, right, with Anka. He was, yeah, yeah. And it seemed like he was the one that kept detracting from the whole plan, but blaming it on Anka as if she was the one that kept messing with the group strategy. And I was thinking at the during the briefing there. I wonder if the frustration was, oh, I tried to screw up the hotel as much as possible, but I couldn't get away with anything. And then when I was in the dune buggy, I tried to be at the front of the line, but everyone was still able to play around me. I, I screwed up like how many boards we went to and we still succeeded. Nothing is going right for me this episode. Yeah, I think Bert and Anka only revising three boards out of 20 is inherently suspicious. Yes. But also, I think in that challenge, the mole either wanted to be in the first or last car. Because in the first car, you can obviously slow everyone down and mess with the system as much as possible. 
In the back car, you're completely unmonitored. So I think the mole wanted to be in one of those two positions. And I was thinking with Manu, she screwed up a lot during the dune buggy task, where she didn't even make she she didn't even make it to the boards, did she? She was still shooting baskets. No, I think she's still shooting baskets. Yeah. Yeah, and she was really she was trying to read out loud and hold up the trailing dune buggy, and then. Of course, during the scuba diving challenge, she kept coming up for air because that could be an intentional sabotage where she's trying to throw off the whole flow of the second half and fail that way. And then, of course, with Anka, too, with uh, being in the dune buggy with Bert and trying to throw things off, she could have been frustrated as well. And, of course, Sven, he put himself in the perfect role of being at the very back by himself. No one's looking at him, getting only two out of four questions right, and then they still earned money for the pot. And he could be really pissed off about that. Final question. Who do you think is going home next week? Ah, that is a good one. Maybe, maybe Philippe. Yeah, my gut is probably saying Manu at the moment. We got a big spike in edit for her this week. So maybe she goes next week. Which would probably help you a lot, to be fair. Yeah, because she's my top suspect right now, just because of I'm thinking maybe she could play off that she really wasn't that afraid of the water. Have you got anything else you want to say? Nope. I think I'm good. Excellent. In that case, thank you for listening to our De Mulberkia Season 10 recap. We'll be back next week to continue the hunt for the nearest mole in the Canary Islands. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, where we are RTV Warriors, or you can email us and contact at rtvwarriors.com. Logan is on Twitter, Logs of Quacky, and I am MJ Harmstone. We will see you next week. Peace out and just chill till the next flavoring. Trust. I be prostitute.